Hello, my dear friends. Rav Moshe Feinstein, who passed away about 35 years ago, was one of the greatest poskim of our times. In America, he was known as the Posek Hador, the Posek of the generation. He wrote thousands of responsa on the entire spectrum of halachic topics. But in addition to being a tremendous Posek, Rav Moshe was also a fantastic darshan. That means that he had special talent in the area of homiletics. And he has a beautiful explanation of a difficult pasuk, or at least it's difficult until you explain it, difficult pasuk in this week's Parsha. The Torah says that you should not build Do not erect a matseva. A matseva is a pillar for, because Hashem despises a matseva. So Rashi explains, what do you, what's the pillar for? So Rashi says, there are two types of altars. There's one type of altar that's made of one stone, and that's known as a matseva, single stone altar. And then there's a, 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 an altar that's made of multiple stones, and that's known as a mizbech. So Rashi explains that before Mat and Torah, before the giving of the Torah, we find that the Avos brought sacrifices on matsevos, on single stone altars. But after Mat and Torah, God says, I no longer appreciate that. In fact, I despise matsevos, and you have to bring carbono sacrifices on multiple stone altars. So the question, the obvious question is, what changed? Why was it okay for the Avos, our forefathers, be the patriarchs before the giving of the Torah, but now God despises a person who brings a sacrifice on a one stone altar, on a matseva. Furthermore, asks Rav Moshe, the, the Torah in Parshas, in Parshas Vayishlach relates that Yaakov, when he came to Basel, he built a, a he erected a matseva, a one stone altar, and he poured libations on the matseva. Of just a few psukim later, the Torah says that Rachel passed away, and he buried her in Beis Lechem, and he erected a matseva by Kever Rachel, which stands even to this very day. So Ramosha asks, why is it that when it comes to an altar for sacrifices, it was a matseva was okay before Matan Torah, but after Matan Torah, you can't have a single stone matseva. But when it comes to tombstones, tombstones were not only okay in the time of the patriarchs, but tombstones are okay today as well. You could use a matseva, a single stone for a tombstone. What's the difference between using a single stone as a mizbeah, as an altar, or a single stone as a tombstone. Says Rav Moshe, here and here's, listen to how beautiful his explanation is. A matseva <laughs> represents something that has no growth potential. It's a single stone. You can't add to it. It is what it is. It's an erect piece of, of, uh, of stone, and it stands in a uh, unchanging state. There's no dynamic uh, transition with the matseva. It's a, it remains the same throughout its period of existence. In contrast, a mizbeach can grow and could you could make additions to mizbeach because it's made of separate stones. So you could keep on adding more and more stones. There's no limit to how how big the mizbeach can grow. So a matseva is okay in a cemetery because in a cemetery you're celebrating the person's life, which is over. There is no more potential for growth at the point of time that the person is buried in the, in the cemetery. So a statue, which stands erect, and it's a permanent, it, 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 it's in a permanent state of uh, st being stationary, that's a single stone, that's okay in a cemetery because we're celebrating the past of one's life. But when it comes to bringing a sacrifice when the person is alive, the matseva would represent the person who rests on his laurels, who's celebrating his past achievements, but there, but there is no growth potential in the future. And therefore, the matseva was, is despised in the eyes of Hashem. Why? What, what changed before Mount and Torah and after? Before Mount and Torah, there were no mitzvahs. There was no obligation to the mitzvahs. So it was okay to celebrate the past because there's no requirement for a person to change in the future. But after Matan Torah, when we have 613 mitzvahs, 
So the person is obligated to fulfill all the mitzvahs. And God wants a person to constantly grow and develop throughout his lifetime. And therefore, a matseva, if a person lives a life of matseva, of a single stone, remaining in a stationary position, that is despised in the eyes of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I remember my father, Olav HaShalom, used to make the final, the following analogy for this concept. My father said there was this, told a story of a, a fellow that went to the doctor's office for an examination. And he was a Torah observant Jew and the doctor was Torah observant. So the doctor wanted to check his heart. So he asked the man to please remove his shirt. And the person takes off his shirt and of course he's wearing tzitzis under the shirt. So the doctor sees that the tzitzis is about five inches by five inches. It's a tiny pair of tzitzis that's draped over his neck and just hardly comes down below his neckline. So the doctor says to the man, why are you wearing such a tiny pair of tzitzis? So the man says, this pair of tzitzis is the pair of tzitzis that my mother gave me when I was five years old. And I, I can't let go of it. So the doctor says, you know, for a five-year-old, that pair of tzitzis is okay. But for an adult, you can't even fulfill the mitzvah with such a tiny pair of tzitzis. And there's certain people that wear the same pair of tzitzis their whole lives. There's no transition. There's no development. They remain what they are, who they are throughout their entire lifetime. And that is Sunday Hashem al-Kechav. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu despises. That's the single stone matzeva that never changes. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, who was also a, a very great person who lived in the 20th century, when Rav Yaakov was 88 years old, he traveled to Russia, and he went to Russia at a time when, this, when the Soviet Union still was in existence, and he met a relative who he had not seen for f- over 50 years. And Rav Yaakov had with him a Tanakh. And the relative saw that he had a, a book in his hand, and he asked Rav Yaakov, what is that? And Rav Yaakov says, it's Tanakh. And the person said, I'm not familiar with that. What is that? And Rav Yaakov was so perturbed that the, 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 the Russian government had succeeded so uh, uh, in such an uh, effective manner to eradicate all traces of the Jewish religion that a man who in his youth had gone to Cheder didn't even know what after 50 years under the domination of the Soviet Union, he didn't even know what a Tanakh was. Rav Yaakov left Russia and he was inspired to start an organization to, to teach young Russians. There was a very big influx at that time of Russians who were coming to America and he established an organization called Be'er Hagola, which even is, is, still stands today. Be'er Hagola was a special uh, network of schools for Russian children who had come from the Soviet Union. Rav Yaakov was 88 years old and he could have easily said, you know, I'm too old. It's not my problem. It's not my responsibility. But he did not rest on his laurels. He did not live a life of Matseva. And he was prepared to start a new institution. And he stood behind it, Be'er Hagola, for the rest of his life. He lived to, uh, into his 90s. When Rav Yaakov was 91 years old, he attended the Siyam Hashas. I think it was in 1982. And, at the, and the Rav Yaakov was the one that was given the honor of starting after the Siyam, of starting Meseches Brachos, the beginning of Shas. And Rav Yaakov was so moved by the Siyam Hashas that Rav Yaakov, when he spoke, announced that he decided that he is going to learn Dafyomi as well. Now, Rav Yaakov finished Shas multiple times, probably hundreds of times he finished Shas. He was an enormous Tamil Chacham. But the, the concept of Dafyomi, of learning one page every single day, so appealed to him that he decided he's going to learn Dafyomi. So at age 91, he decided he's going to embark on learning Dafyomi. And that's a gadol. Then no matter what stage of life the person has reached, he still wants to grow. He wants to develop. He wants to reach a higher plateau. The, the, the Gemara says in Shabbos, when we light the Hanukkah candles, it's ma'alim b'kodesh v'lomoridim. You add an extra candle each day because you're supposed to go up and not go to Beis Shammai says that you go with you light in descending order, you diminish the candles. Beis Shammai says, no, every day you have to, Malam B'Kodesh, when it comes to Kedusha, you always have to be on the uh, ascent, and therefore you light an extra candle each day. We had in our, in our shul 
uh, or Torah. Uh, I think it was about 35 years ago. We had a scholar in residence. We, the, we had the great honor of having Rabbi David Hollander, who was a rub in the Bronx, and he also was a tremendous darshan, like Ramosha. He, had, he excelled in the area of homiletics. And I remember what he said at his drasha when he came to our shul. It was uh, Parsha's Nitzavim Vayelach. Nitzavim Vayelach are often read together. And he said, why, what's the, what, what's the connection between Nitzavim and Vayelach? So Nitzavim means, is from the same word as Matzeba. It means something that is erect or stationary. Vayelach means to go. So he says, when, when you, were, you always read Nitzavim Vayelach, either before Rosh Hashanah or between Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur, so he says, the Tzav and Vayelach presents the following question to a person. What, what ty- it challenges a person. What type of life are you living? Are you living a life of Nitzavim? Are you living a life of, of being stationary, of remaining the same? Are you the same now as you were last year, and five years ago, and 10 years ago, and 20 years ago? Or is your life one of Vayelach? And that, of one of moving forward. And that is a haunting question that we should be thinking about every year. By you, we should think about the whole year, but particularly by Yom and the Rhine. Is our life different today than it was last year? Have we made any changes? If we had, if we had, if we had to write down on a piece of paper, what am I doing different today than I did in the past? Would the paper be blank? Would, would, is there anything that we could include on the paper? You know, we do tshuva. <clears throat> Much of the time, we think of tshuva as tshuva for Averos. We do certain things that are inappropriate. We don't always tell the truth. We're not so honest, especially in areas of business. We get angry. We, uh, we're sometimes, uh, we don't talk nicely to people. There are things that we look at that we shouldn't look at. We speak Lashonara. That's what is, I think is the primary area of tshuva. But tshuva is not only considering the things that we've done wrong. Tshuva has to also be to think about how much have we grown in the past year? How much have we changed? Are we Nitzavim or are we Vayelach? Are we remained the same or have we actually matured and developed and, and reached a higher level uh, in, in our Yiddishkeit? I would add another twist to what Ramosha says, that, the, that a Matzeva represents being stationary, whereas a Mizbeach, it, which ha- has growth potential because you could always add more stones. So there's two two types of growth potential. I would call them one of them vertical, one of them horizontal. There's one type of growth potential where a person grows and is and is more elevated in his Torah observance, in his closeness, in his relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu. But there's also a horizontal growth potential. By that I mean to say that a person Yiddishkeit is not is a multifaceted religion. There's so many different areas. There's 613 mitzvahs, and, and those are just broad categories. And there's so many things to do in Yahad, so many mitzvahs to perform, so many so many svarim to learn in Torah. You, I always speak in front of in my library, because this is the quietest place in my house, but I also like to have in the background my svarim. I have a magnificent library of svarim. I must have about 5,000 svarim. And I, I meet always in the library with the Bar Mitzvah boys. And I say to them, I ask them, how many svarim do you think I have in the library? They say 100, 200. I said, no, it's probably four or 5,000 svarim in my library. So I tell them, you know, if I had to, if I would study every single sefer from cover to cover, it would probably take me a thousand years. That's how, and, and I only have a, a, like a fraction of the svarim that are available in Torah literature. I have now the, uh, the uh, Otsar HaChochma and Otsar Torah, which are discs with, I have over a hundred thousand svarim. I I, 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 I I don't like to, to use those those uh, uh, those platforms because I have such a Yitzhahara, I, I, I scroll through this farm. I could sit, sit the whole day and look at this farm, this farm that I never heard of it, open them up and browse through them. There's so much to learn in Torah. It's like a, a the Gemara refers to it as a, as a yam, as a, as a sea. A never-ending sea. There's so much depth and there's so much content and so much material. That's in the area of, of Torah study. And there's a, in, in, in every single area in Torah, there's so many different as a Jewish life. There's so many different aspects. And a person is not allowed to be 
a matseva. He's not allowed to be one-dimensional. He has to fall, he has to be multi-dimensional. He has to be like the Mizbeach that has multiple stones and not stay uh, stuck in one specific area. I had a, a Rebbe by the name of Rav Chatzko Lichman. Rabbi Lichman was my 10th grade Rebbe. I was, uh, was very, very close with him. And after I left the yeshiva two or three years later, I, I sent uh, Rabbi Lichman a, a, a chiddush, that I, a novel thought that I had on a, a piece of Gemara. And uh, Rabbi Lichman wrote me a very beautiful response. After I got the response, I wrote back to Rabbi Lichman another letter. And I, and I, I sort of challenged him in his response. And he wrote me back. He responded to my letter as well. And then I wrote another letter. You know, I'm a very persistent person sometimes. So I wrote a, th- a third letter. And so Rabbi Luchman wrote me back a letter and he said, you know, Yaakov David, that's my full Hebrew name, I think it's time to move on to another topic. Don't get bogged down in one topic. There's so much to learn. There's so much to know. You can't spend all your time learning one topic. There's a terrific sefer on Yantif Sheni, the second day of Yantif that we observe in Chutzlarts. It was written by a rabbi, Fried, who is now the Rosh Kolo in, in a Kolo in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. But he learned in Eretz Israel for many, many years, and he was very close to Rosh Hashanah Zalman Arbach. So he wrote a sefer on Yantav Sheni. He called it Yantav Sheni Kilhul Chaso. And he talks about literally every single sh- question you could think of about Yantav Sheni, what happens if America goes to Israel, Israel comes to America, and all, all sorts of different shilas that arise. It's a... The, a classic sefer. Anytime I have a question, sometimes we have Israelis in the shul, they have questions about Yantav Sheni. I always, I always uh, refer to that sefer. So he had, I have a, a, a version in my house. In the shul, there's, I have a version that's twice the size because the sefer was reprinted and he added a great deal more to the sefer. He constantly quotes from Shlomo Zalman Arbach, who was an Eretz so one of the great poskim of the 20th century. He, he, in almost in every single footnote, he, he quotes what he heard from Rishon Mazam and Arbach. So he discussed all those topics with Rishon Mazam. So he writes in the introduction to the second printing that he, a, after he had printed the Sefer, so he, he kept he, he kept on approaching Rishon Mazam with new issues and he wanted to, to broaden the Sefer. And Rishon Mazam told him, you know, Rabbi Fried, his, his name is Rachmiel, I believe, he says, Rabbi Rachmiel, now's the time to move on. You gotta, you gotta start a new project. You gotta find another area of Torah study in which to develop an expertise. So that's the idea of not having a matseva in a basic forest, in a cemetery. A matseva is fine. There's, there's no place to go once a person is buried in a cemetery. His life is over. So it's a celebration of the past. So it's okay to have a matseva which is stationary. But when it comes to a human being who's alive, we don't want to have matzevas for ourselves. We don't want to have statues that reflect something that we did years ago, and that's all we have to show for ourselves. We have to constantly be growing and developing and achieving new levels. And if we're, if we're living a life of matzeva, what the Torah says is, Sonei Hashem Al-Kecha. It's despised by Hashem because Hashem does not give us talents that we should squander and waste and not utilize. A person could go through the, his whole life like the fellow with the tzitzis. He's going to wear a pair of tzitzis for a five-year-old. When he's 75 years old, he's still wearing that same little tiny pair of tzitzis. And that's how many people go through life. Their, their, their level of achievement remains the same as they progress through life. And a person always has to be in a constant state of growth. And I think that as we approach the Amin Arayim and we think about tshuva, and we think about what we could change in our lives, in addition to thinking about the Averis that perhaps we've committed, the, the negative things that we have to change, we have to think about what am I doing different now? What can I do different? How have I changed in the past year? And how do I plan to change in the year, in the coming year? And in that way, we'll be able to do appropriate tshuva and we'll be zolcha to exhibit v'chassim